Welcome to another episode of Red Inca. But yes, we've got another crossover because I was listening to West Indies on 99.94 recently. And by recently, I mean about a month and a half ago um, when they were talking about whether Phil Simmons uh, should be sacked or not. This is before the World Cup, hilariously enough. It's a good episode. You should go back and listen to it. Um, and then not long after that, they did another episode about Brian Lara becoming the Sunrise's uh, IPL coach. And both times, I thought Michelle was rubbish on the topic, but Santoki was just... Pitch perfect. Um, and it's it, it's interesting because there's a bunch of really interesting things going on in West Indies when it comes to coaching at the moment. So I've got Santoki on to talk about this. Now, we did plan this ages ago and you've been to Morocco. And we've had microphone <laughs> problems and all sorts of things going on, uh, plus my schedule. In between that time, Phil Simmons has quit. Now, I don't think it's a massive surprise to anyone following West Indies cricket. He's being, uh, uh, as you guys like to say, cussed out on a near on a near second by second basis for people in the Caribbean, uh, and o- obviously West Indies didn't qualify for the second round of the World Cup. I can't imagine that you guys were massively surprised that uh, Phil Simmons quit. No, definitely not. I, as you rightly said, we haven't qualified for the second round of the World Cup. We also had an abysmal 2021 World Cup, and that was with the sort of golden generation, the likes of Gail, DJ, Bravo, Pollard. So he was given another opportunity in 2022 with the new generation, as they like to call it. And unfortunately, it didn't pay off. And you just feel him resigning is a culmination of a tough few years where he's had to tour under COVID regulations. The West Indies have toured a lot of countries overseas. He's been in a bubble. There's been no domestic cricket in the Caribbean, so he's kind of had to blindly select players. And now, as you rightly said, the cutout has reached unprecedented levels after this World Cup, and he's had enough. After the Australia Test Tour next month, he's going to step down from his role as West Indies head coach. Um, This is what I'm going to put out my theory on Phil Simmons. I think he was a revolutionary T20 coach. When originally uh, Tim Wigmore was going to write Cricket 2.0, he he came to me uh, with the idea. And I said I would do it if Phil Simmons was like a major character in it because I thought he was one of the unsung heroes of early T20 cricket. Plus, he would have known all the stories of all the different West Indians. You know, it would have all come together very well. Um, I would say that at times in this tournament, I'm not sure that tactically the West Indies is anywhere near that level. I mean, obviously, some of this has to go to Puran and we'll talk about those sort of things as well. But I don't think he's the revolutionary T20 visionary that he once was, right? Um, Having said that, two, he's a two-time World Cup winning coach and uh, West Indies haven't really had anyone like that in a very long time. I, got, I don't know if it was you or Mash who tweeted out the 16 coaches have either quit or been sacked by the West Indies since the year 2000. Uh, to have your uh, dual World Cup winning coach step down, um, especially as the last time he left, if I remember correctly, he ended up suing the West Indies and making a bunch more money before coming back um, uh, for um, afterwards uh, for his second time around. So he sued for wrongful dismissal. But my basic point is, Phil Simmons was and remains a very good coach. He may not currently be the best T20 or white ball coach um, going around like he was a long time ago, but he has been a fantastic coach for West Indies cricket. That That's unquestionable, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. I think... Um... As you rightly said, he was a revolutionary a few years ago. Unfortunately, you feel as if the format and other teams have caught up and advanced and he sort of stagnated, but he guided that golden generation in 2016 to a remarkable uh, World Cup win. And that was against battling against the Dave Cameron-led administration. As you said, he's had issues, he's left, he's come back. And um, I just feel as well, when you add into the mix, not many coaches in the world have to deal with the nature of West Indies cricket in terms of players pulling up. Obviously, he had to deal with Shimron Hetmeyer missing a plane on the eve of the World Cup. Evan Lewis hadn't been available for most of the year. So it's been a very tough job trying to create this new side, this new generation of T20 players in West Indies cricket, whilst also missing a lot of players at frequent intervals. I mean, throughout the past three years, West Indies have never been able to field their best 11 players in the T20 format. So it's been a massive struggle for Phil Simmons in the role. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, the you, you kind of... In Phil Simmons's role, you're managing up and down, which is a kind of a normal thing for a coach to do, but you're also managing sideways. Um, you know, it, it's like, you know, 9D chess because, you know, Shimron Hetmeyer has individual issues, which he doesn't need to deal with in this cricket ever again if he doesn't want to, right? Andre Russell, to be fair to him, says, okay, I'm going to play in this one day World Cup, even though clearly my knees don't work anymore. Um, whether that was the best choice or not, you know, so Phil Simmons takes him 
and then that doesn't work particularly well. Like it's, it does feel like this sort of constant tussle um, uh, with everything. But but what I really want to talk about was coaching in general because you did do that episode on on Brian Lara. And so for those who don't remember, it was about two months ago, I suppose now, Brian Lara was announced as the Sunrisers head coach, despite the fact that as far as I'm aware, he's never been head coach of a proper cricket team. Is that, I mean, I'm, I'm sure he's, he might have popped into some random league, but as far as legitimate cricket teams go, I don't think he's ever been a head coach before. Um, and I, I think it, I think what it does is it's we're starting to get to that level that obviously we've seen in football. We saw it with Ravi Shastri as well of where, you know, if you know, if you listen to talk sport long enough, eventually um, someone will get angry enough that they'll suggest that a former star should become um, the coach. It's not what we see in American sports, right? In American sports, you have like these professional coaches who come through. It's completely different. In cricket, we're kind of halfway between the, I don't know, the Mickey Arthur level coaches and the Brian Lara level coaches, right? Um, why, why did the Brian Lara one stick so much for you? As, as you rightly said, I think it's just he's got no sort of credentials in, in coaching. He came as a batting consultant for the Sunrisers Hyderabad last year in IPL. But since retirement, he's had about 15 years without taking any coaching gigs. So for him to talk about, for him to be talked of in the region as the next West Indies coach, ahead of guys like Donovan Miller, Shiv Narayan Chandapur, who would earn their coaching badges, it just felt a bit wrong. And, and as if people were going for this celebrity name with no credentials behind them, and, it's kind of strange because you you mentioned football. Cricket's always been a strange one in terms of fan relationship with coaches. I'm um, in especially in t in the T20 format. I think a lot of fans probably don't know exactly what a head coach does in T20 cricket, and that's why there's more of an onus when a team, a franchise, or an international side in T20 cricket has a bad performance. There's more emphasis on players and the captain underperforming, whereas in football. Because fans have an understanding about exactly what the head coach does and his responsibilities, if a Manchester United lose or a Chelsea lose, the pressure is immediately on the head coach. Whereas in cricket, you generally don't see that. Phil Simmons has been one of the exceptions who's faced a lot of pressure as the head coach. But that's mainly because Kyron Pollard, as captain, got cussed out of the role already. So it's unusual in cricket in that the onus is not necessarily on the head coach. I think there's generally still a wider lack of understanding as to the impact coaches have in T20 cricket. And it's more of a player-centric kind of thing in terms of, in terms of how fans view the game. So that's why I probably think a lot of fans, if you ask who should be the new head coach of their team, they don't necessarily go for play people with credentials. They'd go for star names because that's kind of the direction cricket is in at the moment. Mm. No, I mean, all that's really interesting. The, I mean, the other thing is Muhammad Khan, who was obviously Jamaica Tellawala's uh, general manager when they won their title, has probably been on your podcast, certainly has been on mine. He, um, he discussed um, uh, the, uh, he wrote a LinkedIn article about the one thing that we haven't really talked about in cricket is that the coaching position is different and it is different. Oh, he was talking about general manager, but general manager and coaching is different in cricket than it is in other sports because the captain is a coach in a certain point, right? Like far more than a quarterback is far more than I'm trying to think of any other sport that has that sort of quarterback sort of role, right? Like, you know, even a quarterback that other than the Manning brothers and, you know, occasionally the odd quarterback coming through, they're still listening to the offensive coordinator or the, or, or the, uh, or the head coach. Right. Whereas in cricket, you can't even get those messages out quick enough. Right from from a ball to ball situation, we've seen England with the uh, you know Nathan Lehman putting the analysis up on on the thing. Even then, it's not the same as uh, you know having a microphone in the ear of an NFL player or being able to call a timeout in basketball or literally you know in basketball you're like a meter away from the guy. You can just grab him and say run this play right. So it is very different, and also we're not that far removed from the period where. Shane Warne and Ian Chappell would make the constant jokes that the only thing that coaches are good for is the trip to the ground. We we have not had coaching at the international level really until late 1980s, right? And you would have to say it isn't until late, um, maybe early 2000s that coaches become a really major part in international cricket. So it's not like fans are used to, especially older fans, but cricket in general cricket writers, cricket media, whatever, they're not as used to it. A lot of the people commentating in that World Cup, you know, like people like Michael Atherton, probably came into cricket before coaching was the most important role. They probably came into cricket when it was still the uh, the captain who was the most important role. And you could argue that's still 
50 50, you know, whichever direction you want to go. So we have this weird relationship with coaches on top of everything else you've said. Yeah, definitely. And I think if you ask a casual England cricket fan who the coach of the white ball team is, not many will say Matthew Mott, just because, as you rightly said, there's not been, we have a weird relationship with coaching and kind of how we view it. And also the uniqueness of cricket, like in football, for instance, uh, the coach will make substitutions which directly impact the game. Obviously in cricket, we don't have that. And often, for instance, West Indies, when Kyron Pollard was the captain, 15th or 16th over, he could change the tactics, bring on a bowler himself. He, he can completely dictate the play and Phil Simmons is essentially a bystander in the box watching. So the relationship between the coach and the impact he has on the game is minimal compared to other sports, as you said, basketball, football at the NFL. So it, it is weird. It's, it's almost a broken link between sort of fans and how pun and pundits in terms of their relationship with coaches. And um, it'll be interesting to see as the game advances and becomes more tactical, whether the head coach role does become more prominent in cricket. Yeah, no, I, I think that, I think that's very fair. It's also, I think we don't really know at this stage what the best coaches are, if that makes sense. So, so for instance, there's that, you know, the whole thing of Jason Gillespie or Gary Kirsten of like many, so many people going, well, what did they do? They just told everyone how wonderful they were and sat in the background, right? Um, and Trevor Bayliss, you could put, he's probably another one that's a bit like that. Shastri was another one who's like, in some ways more like a cheerleader than a coach. And I, I'm not, not dismissing them because all those coaches had really good success, right? So it's, it, it, that's one, that's that sort of top level strategy slash dressing room you know coach then you've got that other level of sort of you know more mickey arthur um andy moles maybe andy flower where they're involved in absolutely everything and they're like a coach's coach and they've coached all the way up to get to that level right and so you do have these sorts of different things and then i suppose brian lara is is this other one as well of which um you see viv richards at all these different tournaments don't you as the mentor and everything and everyone talk, everyone loves it right like even the players in the, like never like their their fathers maybe are too young to have seen Viv Richards play at this point, right? And yet they talk him up, and they, he brings this attitude, and he he brings this sort of thing. We people like you and me might look at that sometimes and be like, "Well, that's just nonsense, right? What you actually want is a really good coach." But in some situations, that works. So you're at a very weird point when it comes to these sorts of things. Of I don't think in cricket that we thoroughly know what kind of coach that each individual team goes. Needs, sorry. And I would go further than that to say the people hiring the coaches aren't thinking about any of those sorts of things either. Yeah, and if, if, I mean, if you take Mahela Jai Wardenai as, as an example, the Mumbai Indians finished bottom of the 2022 IPL, but he, he was rewarded with a promotion in terms of their global expansion. So it is, and as, as you mentioned, Vim Richards is always seems to be lurking around Brian Lara. There is a massive emphasis on celebrity appeal and names. And it's kind of like past credentials and past achievements in the game override modern tactical knowledge. Um, so T20 franchise cricket is, is strange because we haven't outlined exactly what is a successful coach, as you said, what makes a successful coach. And we haven't given opportunities to qualified coaches or staff because the dominance of X players and star names overrides the game where a game where franchise cricket is so heavily linked to glamour and that star power. Yeah, I, I think so. I was I was actually involved in one coaching um, uh, what hunt. Maybe that is hunt the right word. Uh, when I was with the Melbourne Stars, so the last thing I did with the Melbourne Stars is that they wanted a new coach, and so I contacted the CEO and uh, uh, sorry, the, con the CEO contacted me and said, "Can you give us a list of candidates?" And I was like, "Yeah, of course. What do you want?" What style of coach do you want? What level of coach do you want? Uh, how famous do you want this coach? Is it just going to go to a local person anyway? And this is all a waste of my time. And they couldn't really answer it. And that was a fairly well-run franchise. It wasn't, you know, it could have been run better, but it was a fairly well-run uh, franchise. And the guy was fairly clever. Um, but they hadn't really thought about it. And you look at the big bash and the previous coach was Stephen Fleming. And he'd had a lot of success and I'd worked under, um, uh, under him. But realistically, if you look at the Big Bash, Stephen Fleming's probably not the kind of coach you want for the Big Bash because the majority of the Big Bash is development. 
what you really want to do, especially, but that was before there was any draft or anything else, right? So you're literally just trying to sign kids when they're 18, 19, hoping that they're going to be good in three or four years' time. You really wanted someone whose job it was to be able to upskill everyone individually, whereas Stephen Fleming, as, as we know from Chennai, much more like a high-level coach, much more about strategy, about you know all those sorts of things. But it just it was really clear to me that that hadn't even been mentioned. Right. And it hadn't hadn't really it hadn't really come through. And I think, again, it shows that, you know, in, in cricket, it, it it's just a different role. So to get back to the Brian Lara thing, and I want to bring out Ravi Shastri here. I think if you are a celebrity coach like Shastri or Lara, right, if you come into a system where everything is run really well and really what you need is that top level of ego management of a bit like McCullum, like of, of literally we're just going to tweak the game plan a little bit. Right. We've been doing this. Now we're going to do this. And because, because it's McCullum or Lara, when they say it, everyone listens, right? I think that actually works. And I think that that's probably one reason that Shastri had so much success, other than the fact that India have, you know, so much talent on, on offer to them. But the problem with Lara is he's going into a system that I'm not sure is run particularly that way. And so at that level, you probably need to be really good at time management, at 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 um at understanding how to get the most out of all these different people if you haven't coached for 10 or 15 years and you're having to do anything fundamental other than just sit there and stroke your chin and tell everyone uh do you know what i think you should hit more sixes and i think this guy should bowl at the death that that's the thing that i don't i i think and i think a lot of this comes from t20 franchises because very rarely do t20 franchises have coaches and by that I'm, i don't mean that they don't anoint coaches, but essentially what those people are, they're more like facilitators, right? Of, okay, this guy's coming in at this time. This guy's coming in at this time. The first part of the season, we've got a bunch of road games. The second part of the season, we've got this, and they make a little plan and they go with it. They don't know, like a lot of French, and like in the CPL, half the coaches don't know any of the players before the first day, and it's a week away from the <laughs> tournament. Like, how are they coaching them? Yeah, and I think the, the nature of T20 cricket, as you mentioned, the CPL, coaches will get, what, two, three days maybe, perhaps to work with certain players before the first game. So essentially, as you said, you're not really a coach, you're more of an ambassador, a goodwill ambassador. The, your main objective is to keep morale up, keep players confident, mm -hmm. manage their egos. But other than that, in terms of technical advancements and that, what you're delivering to players, if you've got a a David Warner in your side. He knows exactly what to do as an opener. He knows the game plan. You, you don't need to coach him on how to open. So at the top level, as you rightly said, across franchise cricket, the structure is as such, and the players are so experienced and high quality. Essentially, your, your role as a coach is to boost the side and also be a good PR face, say the right things, get social media clips, talk to the right people. So it is, it is strange because that technical aspect isn't there, whereas obviously in the international game, particularly in Red Bull cricket, where you've got longer to work with sides and there's a longer narrative, your technical um, expertise does come into question. But in terms of franchise cricket, I would say the head coach role is more of an ambassador role. Yeah, yeah. And 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 geez, obviously, when we say ambassador, we're not saying that you would get, you know, one of the mascots from the, the, the Blast to come in and do it. <laughs> like, you know, there are key cricket decisions that you have to make and you have to be on top of it. And obviously, the really good coaches probably prepare for a month coming in and all this sort of stuff. But... You know, I've 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 worked with um, teams where you know two weeks into the tournament, the, uh, the the coach has come to me and said, "I've got these two spinners. I'm not really sure what one is good at what, right? Just because they're two young spinners and <laughs> they're in the side, and he doesn't know which which way to go. And these things do happen. He hasn't spent enough time in 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 having a look at them. Um, so so I do I can see that that also then. It almost feels to me there's going to be two level of cricket coaches going forward. So as franchises get bigger and bigger, and I'm, I'm going to move international cricket away because international cricket is really random and weird. But professionally, I think there's going to be two kinds of coaches. I think there's going to be Brian Lara, and I think there's going to be Donovan Miller. And for those who don't know Donovan Miller, um, uh, he was um, he was a, a cricketer in the UK of West Indies ethnicity. So he's been back and forward. He's coached in both. His big break was probably coaching in the CPL. And then his biggest break, I suppose, was yeah. when England were looking for someone who could do left arm throwdowns um, during the World Cup. And they got him in. And then when they got him in, they weren't realized. And, and I'm not, you're not supposed to say this because it, it makes it sound worse for him. But when they got him in, I don't think they realized how good a coach he was. <laughs> And when he was there, they were like, oh, this guy's really good. And obviously, he, you know, he's now done a World Cup winning coach, uh, plus some success in the CPL as well. He is what I would call 
a proper American style coach, right? Where he has come up, he was not a hugely successful player. He becomes a coach at a young age. He's obviously very smart. He's worked his way up in a in a in a system that's not really made for him to succeed in for many different reasons. But they they're, they're going to keep dropping Brian Lara's in. What he really wants to be able to do is probably create some sort of career where he can be the person who's actually working on the individual coaching. And then you have the Brian Lara on top of him and the Brian Lara basically just says, all right, we're going to whack at this game. Um, and next game, everyone's going to reverse sweep. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can completely envision that structure. As you rightly said, Don, Donovan Miller is someone who puts in the hard work. He has that knowledge. Um, unfortunately, because he's only played club cricket, I think he played a few second 11 games for Essex County. He hasn't got that reputation, so he's not been given chances despite his credentials. He was part of the St. Kitts and Nevis Patriots that won the CPL last year. He's got massive credentials in in the CPL. He's well qualified. We had him on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. He knows the game in and out. He knows about the current trends in T20 crickets, matchups, but he will never be given that big opportunity. Now that Phil Simmons has stepped down as West Indies coach, it's unlikely we'll even hear Donovan Miller's name in the mix as a candidate to take over. So... I can completely see a a structure where a Brian Lava type person is the sort of face, the head coach, but underneath them as the assistant kind of doing, putting in that technical work, putting in the research on opposition teams will be someone like a Donovan Miller and feeds through. Uh, Ultimately, I would like to see a a landscape where someone like Donovan Miller is given the chance to become a head coach and given that opportunity, because that's where I think we'll see T20 as a format innovate and go a bit further. If head coaches are players who are sort of well-versed and grounded in the tactical skills and attributes needed in the format rather than people given the head coach role because of their credentials merely as a player. Mm. I mean, we've had a couple. I mean, um, John Buchanan's probably the most famous example, right, of, you know, Australian coach was, a you know, probably a slightly better player than, than Donovan Miller, but not not at a level that gets him any respect in Australia. Um you know, and, and he goes on to have a good career. Then there's been other guys to, you know, even someone like Andy Moles, who, who was a player, was a professional player, but, you know, sort of built himself up into the sort of the coach's coach. We have seen a few, but I think that now, I think especially with franchises, we're going to see more of celebrity slash coach, which in some ways, it, you know, um, it was something that Shane Warne did really well. Like Shane Warne was not a coach and I know there were, you know, I know a lot of players who played under him as a coach who were like, look, he's a genius and he said some great things, but he was also not a coach as such. But but he would hire people like Darren Berry to do all the coaching work. And Darren Berry's, you know, coaches school cricket and has coached in the PSL and all these different and coach Victoria, uh, assistant coaching and all that sort of stuff. So I do think there is that sort of thing. International cricket, I think, is fundamentally different as a job at the moment because I think franchise really is okay how do we maximize these three months and how do we make everything great i think an international coach's job is much more about long-term development and where does this team go and how do we grow it and how do we plan for a series in three years time and and all that sort of stuff i I wonder if we're going to see like a real divergence where we get franchise coaches and then we get international coaches and they're they're almost their skill sets don't match anymore other than the fact they both have coach in the title yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I'll take West Indies as, as an example. When we play our next bilateral series, we'll be thinking ahead to the 2024 World Cup, T20 World Cup, which is taking place in US and Caribbean. So there'll be a, a wider look at who can we fit into the side who will peak in two years' time. What, what do we want our side to look at in two years? So you'll see more younger players being put into the side, more le- left-wing choices um, being thrown into the side, where, as you said, franchise cricket is very much condensed and focused on short-term results so we will see different methodologies implemented in terms of coaching um international coaches will have to have a wider outlook and there'll be more emphasis on developing players if we pick a a dominant drakes in the side now how are we going to develop him for the next year what skills is he lacking how do we make sure he's ready to play in the world cup whereas in the franchise cricket um circuit it's more of all right we sign this play overseas player he's talented how do we maximize the talent he's got for the next few weeks so different varying skill sets will be needed um, and there'll be a contrast between international cricket and franchise cricket. And obviously the skills needed as a coach in the international circuit, you're not fortunate enough to be able to buy players. You've essentially got a talent pool you have to work with. So again, there'll also be that sort of um, difference in terms of thinking. So 
I think as we go further and further as more franchise leagues crop up, the differences between international coaches in the T20 format and franchise cr- cricket will be a completely different skill set at some point. Mm, no, no. I, I, yeah, exactly. I want to talk about football very briefly. So in football, we get, uh, and I don't know anything about football, but you're a football writer, so you're going to have to fill in the blanks here. But in football, from time to time, we do get former players who were star players who then after, let's say, three, four years outside the game, they seem to say a couple of great things on TV and then uh, they end up as coaches, right? Or they at least get linked to jobs, right? Is that is that fair? Have I have I correctly analyzed football from the as far a distance as I can possibly give? Yeah, yeah, you've got it. You've, you've mastered the sport in, in that short brief statement. I, I, I can go on the main talks about um, station now. Um, <laughs> so, so cricket is different, right? So let, I'm trying to think of a, a situation, but say McCullum or Owen Morgan, right? So there was talking about Owen Morgan literally going straight from retiring, get, becoming coach. That obviously wasn't going to happen, um, uh, but could have happened, I suppose. The reason I think it's different is because if you are a captain, you have a level of coaching within you. You may not always be out there making sure the front elbow is up, but you are thinking about planning. You are thinking about series coming up. You are thinking about developing talent, the best way to unlock talent, strategy, all those sorts of things. So there is an argument, I would say, Brian Lara is not uh, that person you want to hang your hat on here because for 15 years he hasn't been in the game. But let's say Owen Morgan, and McCullum kind of did it as well, you know, Bree stays a radio uh, um, presenter in the middle. Um, but there is an argument to say that through captaincy, we are actually c- training coaches up naturally. There's obviously a huge step forward. You know, um, Gareth Batty is my friend. He's the coach at Surrey. He couldn't believe how much more work coaching was than playing, right? Like, you know, he's got to throw the ball all day. He's got to think about all these different things. Even being a captain and, 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 a, and a, you know, player, he was like, it's way more intense and more time consuming. But from a ba- very basic perspective, I would say that cricket is much better at training um, captains for coaching jobs so that there should be a smoother transition really from playing at the end of your career to coaching than say football and a few other sports. Yeah, definitely. I think being a captain in, in T20 cricket definitely gives you the foundation to make that jump to coaching. As, as you said, the, you sort of focus on the tactical in-game stuff. You you have to deal with a lot of different situations at short notice so I think it does prepare you and also as captain you'd lead the press conferences you have to talk to the media so it does give you a grounding in a lot of skills and I think this is where you kind of have a random lottery and that you will get players like it wouldn't surprise me if Owen Morgan could straight away transition to being a coach when so you will get players who can naturally succeed on whether they have something within them that just makes them a natural leader and adapt to coaching and there will be others who maybe successful captains, but just flounder if given the head coach role. So I think if you don't have anything to bridge the gap between captaincy and coaching, if the, if you haven't done coaching qualifications, it's essentially a lottery as to whether you can succeed in the role. But definitely, I think being a captain does prepare you to make that jump to becoming a head coach, and it makes the jump a lot easier. So I would say, right, that essentially... The Brian Lara position, Brendan McCullum position, you could say that with, let's say, if Owen Morgan got it and a few others, their positions, and you could go all the way through if you wanted to. I think there's actually two roles here, right? So one is really team manager, and that's not the best name for it, but manager. Yeah. Um, so more like a football thing. And then you have head coach. And your head coach's job is to make sure that the machinery of coaching, of player development and everything works. But they go back to a manager who literally works directly with the captain, with the whatever selection panel you have or whatever you know panel that you have there and with the coach to be like, well, this is what we need next. So you need to coach these players in this way because when, you know, let's say you're McCullum, right? So it's almost, you know, McCullum comes in and he's just going to say to his head coach, okay, well, I want you to work with the next eight best batsmen, batters in England and I want them all to smack it. Just get them to smack it. You know, I don't care who they are. Keaton Jennings comes in, has to smack it, right? I think that is probably, and and because cricket is so bad, we still don't have general managers properly right across the sport. I know franchises are starting to get them, but not all franchises have them. Uh, we're, we're still in this era where we don't really, as we've talked about at length, cricket doesn't really understand um, coaches. And then you have captains. I think they would probably feel uncomfortable about bringing another person in. But I'm not actually against that Brian Lara um, position, even if I don't think in his particular case it's the, the the best move. 
I do see someone working in that position, you know, um, making sense. But you also then have to have someone whose job it is to develop people. But the problem with cricket is there's, we've basically just got used to coaching. <laughs> we're, we're only, we're not even just, we've not even really got used to general managers yet. And I'm adding a, an extra job. But I do think that these are all completely different skill sets, even at the franchise level and the international level. I think these can all work differently. But that's kind of listening to you talking about coaching, the way I've been thinking about it and the way I work with franchises. That's really what I've started to see is that these are all completely different skills. And we're trying to hire one person to do like everything, you know, and an assistant coach is as yeah. you can have a great assistant coach, but they still are an assistant coach at a certain point. Right. And, and I do think that is, you know, once you put the word assistant in anything, um, I do think you're not, you know, I think, I think you're strangling people a little bit from that, from their talent. So I, I mean, the way that I look at it is I, I just think that we're, we, I don't think that that particular position of dropping, it doesn't have to be a star. It could be a, a, form, a you know, someone who wasn't a former player as well. But I think if we're going to do that, that's the way, that's what cricket really needs. But because we've had this constant grapple with anyone not being a captain, having any power, um, I think that's where the issue is coming from. Yeah. So I was saying, I think, so I think that's where the issue really is of, um, essentially it's, is that we've been, what we've been calling coaches haven't always been coaches. And because there's all these different layers of complications within it, if we are actually to say, well, this person's job is tactics. And, um, as you said, doing the PR and fronting up to the, 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 that side of it, this person over here coaches and the captain captains, that would make a lot more sense. But I don't think we're emotionally ready for that as a cricket community. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, I've referred to football a few times, but in football up until 10 years ago, everybody who was a head coach was just labelled as a manager. Um, and then in the past 10 years, we've seen that role split. So you've had a head coach and people who were managers. Jose Mourinho was famously angry that he was um, cast as Chelsea as a head coach rather than a manager because a manager's role is to deal with transfers, deal with um, the chief executive as well as coach the side, whereas a head coach role is specifically focused on tactical abilities and working on the training field. So football's already made that split between a manager and a head coach. And based on our discussion, I think football is a few steps ahead of cricket in terms of the relationship with coaching um, that people have. So I think in a few years' time, maybe 10, 15 years' time, we will have this separation of a manager and a coach. But as you said, I just think cricket is still in its primacy in terms of the relationship with coaching. As you said, we've only really had international coaches since the late 80s, whereas football dates back to post-Second World War. So football does have an advantage. And I think if you do look at football and how kind of coaches have evolved over the years and the relationship people have, the perception people have of football coaches, that will trickle down to cricket, but it will take a few years for it to happen. Thank you very much for coming on my podcast. And also, if you use this on your stream, thank you very much for coming on your podcast. Cool. Absolute pleasure, Darren.